All right, uh, thanks for the nice introduction. So uh, today I'm going to tell you about uh, robustness in machine learning. I start with some motivations. Um, this is the example I always use is, uh, this is what happened in April 2013. This is when the Associated Press Twitter account was hacked. And the hackers posted a fake tweet claiming that uh, explosions happened at the White House, um, causing the stock market to plunge, uh, losing $136 billion in stock value in two minutes, I believe. Uh, the whole incident recovered uh, pretty quickly after people realized it's fake. It, it is believed that this was mostly triggered by self-automated trading algorithms uh, that uh, you know, uh, monitors the website and uh, social media for the trusted news sites and uh, make automated trades based on those information. Right? Why it was later revealed in this case, the hacker uh, only did it for fun. Um, you can totally see that there are examples, particularly after this hack is exploited, people can try to uh, take some position in the stock market first and then cause this to hap happen to make money. Right? So there are many examples like this in real, real world where uh, machine learning systems are deployed in practice and people have incentive to manipulate the outcome of those algorithms. Okay. Uh, so there are two more examples. So on the left-hand side, um, researchers show that you can fool commercial grade uh, facial recognition system by wearing this carefully printed out uh, glass frames. Right? So on the top row, you have uh, who, the, who, the people, uh, who the people really are. And on the bottom row, you have who the uh, facial recognition software think the person is. Right? And on the right-hand side, you have people showing that, uh, uh, so these two are both for neural nets. On the right-hand hand side, people have shown that you can put black and white stickers on stop signs to trick that uh, uh, the computer vision algorithm to think it's actually a speed limit sign rather than a stop sign. Uh, just as you want to live in a place where your automated trading algorithm are not fooled by a single tweet, you probably want to live in a place where your self-driving car can reliably identify it, whether it's a stop sign or not. Uh, in this talk, we're going to focus on much more uh, basic and well-defined notion of robustness. Uh, in particular, we're going to try to address some of the challenges that appears uh, in this uh, strategic environment. So uh, let's look at a setting of uh, parameter estimation 101. So this is a setting where you have some model that's uh, generating data based on some parameters. Your algorithm is trying to estimate those parameters from the data. Right, so what could go wrong? Sometimes there's just an adversary in your system. Before your algorithm gets his, hand on, gets his hand on the data, the adversary comes in and say, change 1% of your data. Right? So um, in some other times, there's no adversary in your system. It's just you made a too strong assumption on your input data. So you assume the data is Gaussian, but it's actually something very close to Gaussian. And you will still like your algorithm to work. Uh, even there's a slight model misspecification. Right? And uh, one other aspect that I'm not going to talk about in this talk is uh, sometimes uh, the, the user, you don't have direct access to the data. You're collecting the data from a user, and the user's incentives are not directly aligned with yours. Okay? So sometimes the user have incentives to lie about that data, and you need to figure out what's the best way to, uh, to collect that, to make decision based on that bias data. Okay. All right, so we're going to focus on the first two in this talk. And uh, the goal of this talk is to design fast and provably robust learning algorithms for these problems. And as we'll see in this talk, doing so will require uh, bring together ideas from learning and optimization. Right, so without further ado, we'll move on to the first problem of the talk. So in this one, we'll focus on uh, a setting of collaborative filtering in collaborative filtering called recommendation systems. This is where uh, websites like Amazon and YouTube recommends video or other products to you based on your purchase history and viewing history. It's probably one of the learning systems that inter we interact with most often every day. Uh, the matrix completion approach for this problem just formulates the underlying, da underlying data as a low-rank matrix. This approach become popular during the Netflix challenge. 
So for example, we can think of this uh, matrix as users rating to movies, say between minus five and five. Um, we only get to observe these green entries, but we want to infer what the white entries are. The reason why we may believe this matrix is low rank is, for example, say every movie has certain features and every user has a preference for those features. And the number of features is much smaller than the number of movies. Okay. Right? So in this talk, we consider um, the following setting, which uh, adversary, before your algorithm gets to see the actual ratings, the adversary can uh, does, can change your data in the following way. So, so suppose this, again, this matrix is the underlying ground truth matrix. Uh, the, the green entries are revealed by nature first, and then this adversary comes in. It's actually a pretty powerful adversary. He can uh, read your algorithm. He knows how your algorithm works, reads your code. Uh, look at the ground truth, look at which entries are revealed, and then decide to reveal additional entry to you. Okay, so this is important. I want to be clear here. So adversary is not allowed to change the entries, but he can choose to reveal as many additional entries as he wants. Okay? And after that, the algorithm gets to observe uh, the union of the two sets of entries okay? without knowing which is revealed by nature and which is revealed by the adversary. Okay? Now the goal of the algorithm is again to recover this underlying matrix uh, exactly, or approximately. Okay? All right. So now let me introduce, uh, is the setting clear? Yes. The adversary does not change, it, it just shows you additional entries. Yes. Okay. And I'll show you this breaks some of the existing, well actually all, like all the previous existing non-convex approaches. And I'll tell you why. Okay. All right. Okay. Are you assuming exact uh, low rank or plausible low rank? Exact low rank, just rank R. R is given to you, that's without loss, but let's, for the purpose of this talk, let's say that's the setting. All right. Good, uh, so uh, now I'm gonna introduce some math. Here's the notation. So I'm assuming I have an n by n rank R matrix M star, and a set of entry is revealed to me, right, like this, and goal is to recover M star. Uh, there are two uh, main, lines of approach that can solve this problem. One is a convex relaxation, where you minimize the sum of the singular value of m, the nuclear norm of m, uh, subject to it agrees with everything you observe. So uh, here you, uh, want to, you actually want to minimize the L0 norm, the rank of, the, uh, of m, but you can't, so you relax this and minimize the L1 norm instead. Uh, but we're not going to focus on this. Um, for the purpose of this talk, uh, we're going to focus on non-convex approaches because this is uh, too slow in practice. Everybody run non-convex, run gradient descent in practice. Okay, so this is the, uh, the most common, the most natural non-convex objective function. So you just minimize the sum of the least square error on everything observed. Uh, and x is this uh, low rank factor, that's the variable of uh, your uh, problem. So the intuition behind this objective function is you are hoping, let's say if these uh, entries in omega, the entries revealed to you are uh, ID uniformly at random, then this objective function um, would approximate, by concentration bound, approximate the Frobenius norm of the matrix. And this is the thing you really want to optimize. Okay. All right. So. Uh, let me convince you first that this is non-convex. Um, so what you can do is just take a two by two example and you only observe these two entries. This is the objective function. And if you plot it out, it looks look like this, okay? So uh, in this particular example, um, even though this objective function is non-convex, it has a, a very good property, namely all local optima is globally optimal as well are globally optimal as well. And, and it turns out this is not only a uh, uh, property for this example. When your matrix is large enough, and the prop if you observe every entry with the same probability, and that probability higher than some threshold, this is uh, true in universal. Okay. So all local optima are, are global uh, in, in this case. Right? Uh, but for the IID case. Um, right, so, um, we, we, there's a lot of work on study the non-convex approach for this problem. Uh, we know that you know, if you initialize carefully with SVD, then it works. 
Uh, we know that around the ground truth, uh, this problem uh, is strongly convex. And we know what happens, you know, like if you have regularization, uh, then you don't have to initialize very carefully. But all of these previous work in the non uh, uh, analyzing the non-convex algorithms uh, require the following uh, very strong assumption. It requires that you observe every entry with exactly the same probability p, right? So the main contribution, one of the main contribution of our work is to ask uh, what happens to the non-convex algorithms when uh, you have this semi-random adversary. So this is slightly different, but, but um, essentially equivalent, I would say, to the model I described. So the one I described, adversary can add the data after it's drawn by nature, but it's similar to uh, if the adversary just set the probabilities to be ij. All right, um, good. So, uh, right, yes. There is a difference? So uh, I don't know. But the, the good news is that our algorithm works for the stronger model, where the adversary can you know, adapt and re-add. Uh, but the lower bounds holds for this weaker model where, uh, yeah. All right, good. Uh, right, so pictorically, it shows when everything's ID, your, your fx look like this. And when the adversary adds some additional entries, and then your function uh, no longer behaves very well. You get all these uh, these uh, bad local optima that is uh, doesn't give you a very good solution. Okay, and we'll see a counterexample on the next slide. Okay, good. All right. So to convince you, I'll just give you uh, the following example. It's not a, a, a formal example, but it conveys all the important intuitions. So here, the underlying matrix M star is just the all ones matrix. And what the adversary did was it revealed uh, way more entries on the diagonal block compared to the off-diagonal block. Okay. And I'm going to convince you that this particular x is a uh, local optima. Okay. So if you write out xx transpose, your matrix, your variable matrix at the end of the day, it looked like this. Um, so first observe this is a very bad solution because it's very far from the global optimum. So all I need to do is to show you that this is a local optimum. Okay, so intuitively what happens is uh, just consider, uh, let's say you're standing at this point x and you're trying to move a little bit towards a global uh, optimal solution. Okay, let's say you move to 1 uh, minus 0 0.99. Okay, and then you write out this uh, matrix after you take this little step. It will look something like this. Okay. However, because you observe uh, way more entries on the, um, so, so right, so look at this XS transpose compared to the ground truth, which is all ones matrix. You're doing uh, better on the off diagonal blocks because they're closer to one now. And you're doing worse on the off diagonal block because it's further away from one, okay? But because you observe way more entry on the diagonal block, your objective function actually increases if you move a little bit. And that's intuitively uh, why x is a local optimum. Okay. Um, and at a high level, it breaks uh, the two x explanation. Um, at a high level, it breaks because the, the reason why you're optimizing fx is you're hoping this is a good surrogate for the, the Frobenius norm. Okay. This is true when things are ID, but obviously not, no longer true when things are not ID. Okay. Another explanation is this x recover the, uh, the structure of the observation matrix of this green pattern matrix instead, rather than the structure of the ground truth matrix. Okay. Um, is there a probability you find uniform with the expectation of like the weighted loading approximation which is known? Yeah. Yes. Right, so, so essentially you're trying to recover the structure of that expectation matrix, which is the observation matrix times C. Yeah. All right, good. Right, so the bad news is uh, even you just have this uh, mi very minimum change that all the probabilities are, are increased to numbers that are unknown to you. Existing non-convex algorithm do not work. Um, the, uh, but the good news is we can still fix them while preserving the, the, their efficiency. So how do we fix them? So, uh, so let's take a look, a more careful look, at the counterexample of what the adversary actually did. If I knew the adversary was changing the probability in this way, it's actually a very, there, there's a very easy solution for me to counter uh, the influence. Right? 
So for example, one thing I can do is I can put smaller weight on the uh, observations, uh, for the observations on the diagonal block. And essentially, this becomes, uh, uh, you know, uh, th these four blocks get roughly the same way, so this becomes similar to a random input. Or I can just subsample on the, in these diagonal blocks, so I get my uniform IID uh, observation matrix back. Okay. It turns out that's, uh, that's the idea we're going to use. We're just going to try to reweight all the observations we have so that the, after the reweighting, the objective function is approximately similar to what you would get had you sampled IID uh, uniformly. Okay. So we're just going to change the objective function by adding a weight wij here. So the way we solve this uh, more formally, we're going to formulate this uh, bipart uh, a graph problem. We're going to build a bipartite graph where if an uh, entry is observed, I'm going to add an edge between the corresponding node for, for the row and the column. Right, so um, you know, this matrix corresponds to this graph. Now, uh, if you look at this graph, how did you arrive at this graph? So first, nature revealed a random bipartite graph, uh, GNMP, to you. After the adversary examining this graph, the adversary adds a bunch of extra edge to this graph, and your goal is, for example, you're, you would be done if you can recover the original random graph um, drawn by the nature. Drawn by nature, okay? Right. But it turns out this is impossible, very easy to see, because for example, the adversary can just reveal to you another set of random entries, and there's no way for you to distinguish the two. Um, as I will try to explain intuitively on the next, next slide, uh, what you should uh, uh, the right requirement is to recover a graph um, from H that's spectrally similar to G. Okay. All right, so what's, uh, what does spectral similarity mean? So um, it's proposed in spectral graph theory as a tool of trying to construct a much sparser graph. Yes? And, and I guess the key thing you're using here is that all two random, like any two random numbers are spectrally similar. Otherwise, otherwise it would Otherwise yeah, otherwise this doesn't make sense. But um, yeah, sanity check. One one. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, quick question. If I were just to um, count how many observations I have in each row or in each column and reweight just by, by something. Yeah, good. That, that's a great question, actually. Um, you remind me of something I forgot to say. Um, so the good thing about this counterexample is that if you look at it again, um, if I'm just changing the probability in this way, in expectation, the number of observations you get in every row and column is the same. So that kind of reweighting wouldn't do you any good. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, great question. Um, all right. So, yeah, so spectral similarity is a generalization of cost similarity. So, um, so you know, G and H are least similar in the following sense, that if you take a look at the value of uh, every cut, the value of G and H are off by a most, say, uh, 1 plus minus epsilon. Okay. And why is this the right notion? So this is the, uh, the only slide I'm going to try to uh, explain to you why this is uh, a necessary condition. Okay. So uh, if you look at the counterexample, so what happened is you just have a partition of your graph where inside these uh, two components, your graph is very dense, but across the partition, your graph is very sparse. Okay? And as we've seen in the, uh, in the counterexample part, this will cause the issue for you. Okay? So you don't want this to happen for this particular partition. And it turns out you don't want to, this to happen for any possible uh, bisection, for example. Right? So you want, you want for any possible bisection, after you partition this, uh, the, it kind of looks... looks hmm should be on the outside. It kind of looks uh, random. Okay? And this is uh, what cut similarity would give you to say that your matrix is similar to a random matrix in this sense. If you measure it by taking a bisection and measuring the density, it looks roughly the same. Okay? Uh, that's why it's uh, intuitively a necessary condition. Um, um, yeah. And for the rest, you can go to the paper and see the proof. Okay, good. So the way we solve this is we uh, uh, utilize uh, recent developments in uh, graph sparsification, in particular deterministic graph sparsification. Um, so we can solve this uh, problem, this uh, recover random graph problem in nearly linear time. So the, the big picture of the entire paper look like this. Yeah, these two are equivalent. 
So you can use a deterministic graph sparsification to solve this problem very efficiently. And after that, you need to prove uh, spectral similarity is sufficient to guarantee that this function has no bad local optima. This part re will require some of the uh, previous non-convex uh, approaches similar to some of the uh, previous non-convex analysis to, to matrix completion. All right, so in summary, uh, the, the, the main contribution of this work is that we uh, look at uh, a matrix completion, non-convex matrix completion, uh, semi-random adversary setting. And we propose this uh, uh, conceptually uh, simple framework that you just run a very lightweight pre-processing step that fixes uh, uh, your objective function. And now that your objective function is good again, you can run your favorite algorithm on this uh, non-convex objective function and uh, recover a good solution. Okay, yes. <coughs> Regarding the first bullet rule, you didn't show us that. Yeah, go ahead. Non-convex approaches actually don't work. You just show that there are various local minima, but maybe their abstraction region is, is extremely small. And if I initialize those methods, I don't know, 10 different friends on initialization, one of them gets to the big local minima. Right, so um, in the paper, we have a result show that if you initialize with SVD, uh, actually doesn't work. So you will end up in a bad local optima. And um, while we've never done an experiment um, to verify what you said is not true, I personally believe it is false because um, like essentially the, the reason why it fails is just because it's no longer a surrogate for the Frobenius norm. So I, I personally believe that you know, like if you restart, say, 100 times, you always end up in bad local optima. Um, but yeah, no, I, we've never done experiments. Yes. Good. You know, great question. That's a everything is tailored to based on convex graph issue. Yeah. Great question. That's another thing I forgot to say. So um, the, the convex relaxation actually works immediately for this setting because um, the or even after uh, so the adversary just reveal additional correct data to you. So it's adding correct constraint to your uh, nuclear norm minimization problem. So if your uh, convex program can find the solution before adding this additional constraint, it can still find the optimal solution after adding these constraints. Uh, that's why uh, you know, this is more tailored to non-convex approaches. So yes, the short answer is convex works for this setting directly. All right, now we move on to the second part of the talk, uh, which is going to be on uh, how to design fast and robust algorithms for high dimensional statistical problems. Um, so robust statistics is a field that dates back to at least the 1960s, back to Tukey and Hoover, uh, where statisticians ask the following question without caring too much about computational complexity. So they want to design uh, provably robust statistical estimator when, uh, uh, when uh, there's a slight model misspecification. Like uh, the example I gave, you know, an estimator works for Gaussian. Now what if it's, you know, a distribution is very close to Gaussian? Does it still work? So they've been able to show that, you know, certain estimator work for this problem. Um, but again, uh, some of the, as we'll see later in the talk, some of the, those estimators are NP-hard to compute. Um, so in this talk, we're going to uh, care more about the computational complexity of this problem. Right, so uh, some, again, some motivation. So the first, very first example I mentioned in the talk, you can view this, the reason why those automated trading algorithms uh, failed is because they're running sentiment analysis. So they're designed, they give every article a score, and then eventually they try to take some kind of weighted mean of those, uh, of those score. And based on that, they decide whether the market is positive or negative, and then they make trades. Um, so you could argue that in this case, there's just very few examples that uh, change that uh, weighted mean by a lot, and that's why those algorithms started to behave erratically. Okay. And uh, in another setting, uh, in a lot of biological data, the, um, the data we have is intrinsically high dimensional and noisy. So we'll, we'll see one example here. This is a famous study conducted in uh, Nature in 2008, uh, where the, the conclusion of the study is genes mirror geography. So what they did was they, 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 they took the uh, genetic data of 1,500 European citizens after filtering and 
uh, took the uh, top two uh, singular vector of that data matrix and plotted it out on a two-dimensional uh, space. Okay, and uh, it's color coded by uh, you know the nationality of that person, where uh, yeah. and it kind of looks like Europe. Um, but as we all know, uh, the top two singular vectors, the top singular vectors are, are essentially measuring directions that maximize the variance. And that's why uh, it's a very sensitive to outliers. So if you just take a few people's data and uh, pull them really, really far away, that will change your top two singular vectors, uh, which in this case will shatter the map of Europe. And you would very much like to have an algorithm uh, that could still approximately recover the map of Europe uh, given these outliers. Okay. Even in that yeah. paper, they have an algorithm that uh, 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 iteratively kind of computes the PC, prunes the people who have changed for two months or far away from the mean, and then does this like six times. I see. Yeah. Okay. So does Good. That, does, that I didn't does that work in your example? Um, like, do you need to design a new algorithm, or does the you know the existing nature paper work already? Uh, I believe the, uh, you need new algorithm, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, yeah, these are work by uh, a research in our community, not myself. But I can verify that for you later. What are these dots which are black? Uh, they are, so th in this picture, they are, uh, so they are just the data that's a little bit further away uh, from the data. So you can think of them as uh, uh, roughly having the same norm, but they are all concentrated in a certain direction to increase the variance in that direction. So the black dots are just uh, wh where they are after you project it using the previous singular vector, using yeah, the, the correct singular vector. Places. Yeah, where the outliers are. Um, however, uh, you know, they're, they're, you know, this is a projection of some high dimensional data. And uh, they're also shown in both these pictures. So um, what, is, what is exactly the problem we want to solve here? So this is kind of a, a second moment problem that you're trying to estimate the covariance matrix of your data robustly. So we're, we're gonna, we can do that, but we're gonna start with a, a simpler problem, which is mean estimation. Okay? We're gonna start with the uh, statistics one one case where you're just trying to estimate the mean of a spherical Gaussian. Okay? This is a very well studied problem. We know exactly, we know, it's, for example, empirical mean works, and we know exactly how many samples you need to take uh, for this to be epsilon close to the true mean. Okay. And in particular, uh, I want to focus on the running time uh, in this talk. So the compute, computing empirical mean is very efficient. You just go through all your data once and take uh, coordinate wise mean, right? So the running time of this algorithm is linear in the input size, which is which is n samples and each of them is d-dimensional. Okay. Now, what do I mean by robust mean estimation? So uh, this line of work consider uh, the adversarial uh, epsilon fraction corruption. So what I mean is uh, before your algorithm gets to see the samples, the adversary comes in. And again, this adversary uh, is very powerful, as we'll see on the next slide. But roughly speaking, he just removes 1% of your data and replace them with uh, arbitrary samples and then feed this input to your algorithm. Okay. Right. So more specifically, the, the game proceeds as follows. The, uh, you have your algorithm first propose a sample complexity n, and the adversary, after examining the ground truth, uh, the, the samples, the good samples, and your algorithm uh, will change uh, an epsilon fraction of the, the data, and your goal is to recover the true mean. So why is this an important problem? Um, so people have shown that, you know, first it's a fundamental statistical question that I think it's, it's worth uh, answering. And the, the, the other uh, application is that people have shown that you can uh, use this as a black box to uh, develop algorithm uh, for a supervised learning problem. The reason behind this is uh, a lot of these uh, learning problems can be solved by gradient descent. And you can view gradient as uh, the mean of some function on your data. So if you can robustly estimate the mean, uh, the, these, uh, these, uh, these functions are usually bounded as well. So if you can robustly estimate the mean of your gradient, you can run what they call great, robust gradient descent. And that's why you can, uh, you know, if you have a, a linear regression instance where 1% of data is corrupted, you can use this algorithm to solve it uh, 
uh, and get a good solution. Okay. So what do we know about this problem? So uh, it turns out it's uh, pretty hard. Um, so uh, all the previous, no all the estimators that are known a while ago either doesn't run in polynomial time or uh, has an error guarantee that depends on the dimension of the data. Okay. So the important thing in this line of work is we want a polynomial time algorithm with dimension independent error guarantees. Okay. We just want the error to depend on epsilon. And three years ago, uh, uh, people gave polynomial time algorithm for this problem, where the error guarantee is uh, almost dimension independent or dimension independent. Okay. However, if you look at these robust algorithm, and look at their running time, they all need to pay at least uh, an additional d factor uh, in order to be robust. Okay. And the main motivation of uh, our work is to ask whether this factor of d is necessary or not. Uh, it turns out it's not, and this is uh, our. Uh, these are our results. So not only it works for Gaussian, but it also works for a larger family of distributions like sub-Gaussian and bounded covariants. Um, right. So um, you should think of epsilon as some constant. So uh, you know, don't. And, and there are later works that remove this poly, poly epsilon dependency. So the important thing about this table is that there is actually uh, you know matching lower bounds. So all of these. Uh, uh, error guarantee, sample complexity, and running time are all tight up to constant or poly log factor, depending on whether you have a tilde there or not. <coughs> yeah, so the message is you can actually do robust mean estimation uh, without you know, paying additional, uh, additional uh, cost in either the sample complexity or running time. Yes? Sorry, I'm just missing something. So if I understand correctly, it's smaller epsilon should be Good. So first, um, smaller is easier, but your error guarantee is better, right? So let's say when 10% of the data is corrupted, you're allowed to yeah, you're allowed to output a solution that's 0.2 far away, but if 1% is corrupted, you have to output a solution that's 0.02 far away, right? So 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 you have to solve certain optimization problem to a better precision, and that's why this is happening. And um, more importantly, I think uh, you know there are recent there are work uh, developed this year that remove this epsilon dependency. Yes. So epsilon is a fraction of data points that are um, changed. Corrupted. Yeah. Can they change the arbitrary though? Can they be they can. Uh, the, yeah, uh, arbitrary. You can do whatever you want, and you do it after you read my code. And the data. And the data and the ground truth, but yeah, so mostly my code. <laughs> Um, in some sense, yes. Um, let's say, but you know, statistical is imp information theoretically is impossible because the adversary can just draw another epsilon fraction of good data, give it to you, so you can't distinguish. So it turns out the right notion is you can throw away everything that 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 affects your answer. You can throw away the bad things. changes epsilon of your point, but by very little, because if you could change them by a lot, I could de detect the outliers, remove them, and, and, and not have an error of epsilon at all. It's, it's, uh, so the ad uh, what the adversary does is change only a little bit epsilon of the point to have a different mean, but such that it's not distinguishable by the norm or any other quantity. Yeah. So you can't detect the outliers. Um. So the good example to think about is you just have a d-dimensional spherical Gaussian, let's say. So everything is roughly distributed on this uh, sphere of radius root d. Uh, and the what the adversary did was uh, it picked a random direction and added a lot of bad samples on the sphere exactly. along that direction. So, so you can tell that along that direction something's off. But among those samples, you don't know which ones are originally there and which are added by the adversary. But you can do this. You can throw away some samples. So that previous work does this. You can throw away some samples so that you can prove the, uh, the empirical mean after that is close to the true mean. Right. Good. And since we give a faster algorithm for this problem, uh, we also give a faster algorithm for the 
supervised learning problem that can be solved using robust gradient descent. Good question. How strong is the assumption of identity covariance for your network array? Um, so it works for bounded covariance, right? So you know any sigma that's bounded by an identity. Um, if it's more, you can there's you can you can take a, a you know if sigma is at most little sigma i, then your error is little sigma times root f. I can answer that better offline, but yeah. All right. Okay. So um, actually, only have this one slide. Right? Yeah. So uh, now let me try to tell you why we're able to do this faster. So this, I think, it's uh, the, the the main technical contribution of the paper, the meat of the paper. Um, so let's let's. Again, go back to this case where uh, you know you, you just have this high-dimensional sphere somewhere uh, far away from the origin. You're standing at the origin. You're just uh, trying to tell where mu star is. So um, you can do this calculation yourself. If you compute this empirical second moment matrix, it roughly should uh, equal to uh, when you have enough samples, it sh should approximate identity plus mu mu transpose. Okay. So that means if you take this. Uh, uh, it, empirical second moment matrix and compute its top eigenvector, it will rough it will align with mu star. Okay. All right. However, this is no longer true when I uh, added some corrupted samples. So what does what does top eigenvector mean? It just means uh, it's measuring the direction where the variance is highest. Okay. However, after I add the red samples, this direction y prime, for example, would have larger variance than the true direction uh, mu star. Okay. And I recover this. Uh, so if you take this matrix again and recover the, uh, the uh, and take the top eigenvector, it will give you this direction. Okay. So how do you avoid this? Turns out the right thing to do is to solve a generalized, what I call a, a, you know, a variant of the eigenvector problem, where after you take the direction, you throw away 1% of the data of the farthest points, and then you, you take the variance of the remaining points. Why would that give you the direction y instead of y, y prime in this case? Because if you project along the direction y prime, after the projection, you're going to throw away these red points. So the variance becomes uh, close to 1 if you project along uh, y prime under this uh, definition. The right thing, on the other hand, if you project along y, these uh, blue samples have, that's uh, further away from the origin are going to get thrown away. But because this is a Gaussian, that doesn't hurt you too much if you only throw away uh, epsilon fraction. So uh, it turns out you can, you can formulate this as a positive semi-definite program, and you can use recent developments in optimization to solve this in near, nearly linear time. And the, the yeah. It's not a standard SDP, like this is a convex function, but it's not a linear optimization. Yes, so you need, to, um, you need to flip the objective function and the constraint, but you can do it. Uh, it's not that hard. Um, so you can cast this in a standard um, yeah, standard uh, standard form of positive SDPs. No, but I think the question is. Oh, sorry. Is yeah. the integrality gap going to be large? So you're going to solve it otherwise? Um, or you just solve it in a second SDP? You just, um, there's no integrality gap, right? Uh, uh, so, oh, good, good. So uh, there's no integrality gap. Um, you can show that, uh, you know, like if, if you only, have, for example, if you only have the correct data, then then this m would be very close to rank one, and will give you it will give you mu mu transpose essentially. Yeah. No, but with the noisy data. Uh, if you solve this, uh, because you remove the one percent, it will still be close to rank one. Good. Yeah. Okay. No, yeah. no. But if you cast this as an SDP, are you going to solve this exact problem, or some relaxation? No, I'm going to solve this. Except I'm going to change it. I'm going to flip something so that becomes positive SDP. This is not a positive SDP. Yeah. It's a SDP, though. So, yeah. so the first step was with the claim that the eigenvector would be in direction mu star. How many samples do you need for that? Or yeah. If mu star is very close to the origin, that argument falls. That's true, yes. So uh, there is an argument. Uh, I'm that I'm hiding on the outside that wraps this, that says, you know, just, sol just do this log n times, and you're good no matter what. Log n is the, 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 the 
Um, so right. So 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 the the guarantee of this part is to say that if you are sufficiently far away from mu star, then you can find a vector that aligns very well with it. So you can move closer to it by a constant factor. And you know when you are close enough, then uh, then you're just good. Um, and this wouldn't hurt you. Uh, but you, you can tell after you solve this uh, SDP, judging from the value of this the, the SDP, you will know whether you're close enough or not. And when you're close enough, you can just stop. And you're, you're right that if this is too small, then it's not true. All right. Um, good. All right, so uh, zooming out a little bit. So the high level, uh, the conceptual contribution of the work, I think, is the following. So back in the 60s, people examined this question without caring about computational complexity. And um, three years ago, uh, the TCS community provided at least polynomial time algorithm for these problem. And the line of work that we're hoping to initialize is to uh, not only stop at po not, not, do not stop at polynomial time, but to ask, like, can you actually match the best running time of the non-robust estimators? Okay. So uh, as I've kind of showed you in this talk, that you can do this for robust mean estimation. In a later uh, paper uh, in code, we showed that you can also match the uh, best running time of computing the empirical covariance matrix, but you can do this uh, robustly. Okay. Uh, there are many open problems. So uh, one is what happens when your uh, input data uh, is, when your mean vector is sparse. So just a spherical Gaussian, but your mean is sparse. In this case, you can get away with much smaller sample complexity. So your sample complexity depends on the sparsity, not the dimension. Uh, but we don't know whether you can do this in uh, nearly linear time yet or not. Okay. And you can ask this question, uh, whether you can match the running time, for more uh, complicated distributions like uh, base net and what your favorite distribution. Uh, and um, this last bullet is uh, you know, some work in progress that we're doing here is um, you know, sometimes you may not be, uh, you may not actually want an uh, algorithm that have best asymptotic running time. You, you may just be, be better off to have a simple uh, algorithm that's conceptually very simple. For example, the algorithm is just a run gradient descent on some objective function. And the question is whether you can, uh, you can have an algorithm like that that solves the robust mean estimation problem. All right. Questions? Good. So uh, now let me summarize in the entire talk. So um, in this talk, the, you know, sometimes you uh, you have this adversary in your system, but sometimes your model is slightly misspecified. But no matter what happened, is you have a, a machine learning problem where your uh, algorithm used to work, but now uh, your assumption on the input is uh, broken, and your algorithm no longer works, right? So in the matrix completion case, you would have a, your most natural non-convex objective function would have local optimus, bad local optimus. And in this, uh, in the high dimensional statistic case, your covariance matrix would be uh, far from the true covariance. Right? But the good news is that in both cases, you can use uh, techniques from optimization to de design uh, algorithms that are robust while not paying too much in the running time. Right? So all of these algorithms have running time that are essentially as uh, nearly optimal. Okay. All right. Um, yep. That's it. Uh, thanks.